Welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. And for those listening on the Advice and Insights podcast, welcome to you as well. If you want to get the kind of weekly uh, nitty gritty of what I'm doing this week as far as this actual week's market commentary, um, what we would be doing at DividendCafe.com and all that writing and all of uh, those charts and so forth, then obviously you get the written version of DividendCafe.com. But from a podcast standpoint, I'm going to go through all of that at our weekly Dividend Cafe podcast. For the video this week, I actually want to focus on just a particular couple topics, and that's obviously what you're hearing right now on the Advice and Insights podcast. But as far as the Dividend Cafe side, we really do unleash, uh, unpack this uh, GDP number, 4.1% GDP growth, much more talk about tariffs and all those things. Um, and, and there's, I think, one of the, my favorite sections I've written all year about behavioral investing. We talk about both China and Japan. So I'm going to put that aside, and I want to talk to you guys about particularly uh, something to do with the Federal Reserve. You know, we've talked all year long about the impact the Fed has in elevating volatility when they remove some of the just kind of um, accommodation that's existed in the economy on a monetary level the uh, combination of extraordinarily low interest rates and extraordinarily high Fed balance sheet where they add a lot of liquidity, excess reserves to the banking system, and uh, particularly when they were in the act of buying bonds in their three different rounds of quantitative easing where they effectively added $4 trillion to their own balance sheet. And now we're in the position where obviously they've been slowly increasing rates on the short end of the curve, the overnight federal funds rate, and they have not been selling bonds back in the marketplace, which is literally pulling money out of the economy. But when some of their securities mature, they're not rebuying. They're just letting them float into outer space. And so it's, it's what we call roll off. And it amounts to a mild form of tightening because there ends up being less money on their balance sheet than there was before. There's not this continued renewal and so that's been the focus from our conversation about Federal Reserve policy, how they balance trying to get to an inflation mandate, not get higher than the inflation mandate, not um, stunt economic growth, but not allow economic growth to go too far. Uh, and, and so they have this kind of, you know, they talk about one of their mandates being full employment. We have right now the lowest unemployment in decades. You have this 3.8% unemployment rate. But the Fed's still and obviously not at all a neutral position. I mean, when you have a basically 0% net of inflation federal funds rate, you can hardly be called uh, overly tight. So the Fed's trying to get less tight, and yet at the same time, um, they're not really uh, uh, sure that the inflation genie is yet uh, uh, getting out of that bottle. So the, the monetary uh, policymakers have a difficult task ahead. Well, I wrote an article at Market Epicurean this week, our own site for kind of higher end, a little more sophisticated economic topics, to deal with the fact that this politicization of the Fed and, and fears around what the Fed may do. Everyone's worried about the Fed raising rates. Well, the Fed needs to raise rates. The Fed cannot have something between 0 and 2% and argue that they have a defensive tool in their toolbox for when we have a real recessionary environment. So while naturally the, the hangover effect of slowly removing some of the good stuff from the punch bowl, so to speak, uh, has to be dealt with. That's, that's been known for years that this was coming. The idea of being able to borrow money for free forever is, is preposterous. And it's staggering to me that there are economic actors that are wondering like why all of a sudden the short-term interest rates at 2% instead of 0% or something like that. I, actually not or something like that. Those are literally the numbers. But that's not to say that there's not concern with where the Fed stands right now. Um, the advice and insights I would offer to you this week is that the greater concern we have is the Fed becoming an accommodator to congressional spending and executive branch spending, federal government spending. It's out of control. They are uh, running very large deficits, and that is uh, people can blame tax reform all they want. 
uh, tax reform barely move the needle as far as lost revenue and on a dynamic basis, I'm firmly convinced it won't even add to the deficit, that the stimulus effect of the economy will create more revenue, thereby the lower tax rate will equal a higher amount of revenue and become, let's call it deficit neutral, if you will. But the fact of the matter is it was, not a com it was not accompanied by any kind of spending cuts. And so when we have an out-of-control entitlement liability on the Medicare and Social Security side and the continued discretionary spending that has grown, I have to think, it has not happened yet, I have to think we face a point at which the percentage of federal treasury outlays that is just simply servicing the debt, that that begins to grow as interest rates go higher. So far, it's still remarkably low percent, but the federal treasury did nothing over nine years of almost 0% interest rates on the short end to, and very, very low interest rates on the longer end, 10 and 30 years, to lock in the lower cost of borrowing. They essentially continued to benefit from the virtually free amount of borrowing free cost of borrowing on the short on short term securities and yet when you have a 21 trillion dollar uh, liability sheet it would be nice to have locked in lower rates into the future they now face an increased liability when interest rates reset in that case well is it the central bank's job to monetize those debts the answer is of course no but the answer is deeper than that historically this is essentially what central banks and banana republics end up doing. Our Federal Reserve is not doing it to that degree. I write in this article I reference about certain things that concern me, that there, that there becomes little things on the edges, almost sort of administratively, that represent the Fed doing things for Congress that I think represent a dangerous precedent. But no, we don't have a central bank that's identical to a federal government that's literally going out printing the money to pay bad government debts, like a Venezuela, Argentina has been in that position over the years, obviously Zimbabwe. You know, these the examples and Federal Reserve haters that use those examples are not helpful because they're cartoonishly stupid. But there is a fact whereby the Federal Reserve can become an enabler without going to those extremes. And it's my belief that uh, to have a central bank that is going to ensure sound transfer of payments, that's going to uh, theoretically um, attempt to deliver a sound dollar, sound money has been out of vogue in our country for a long time, we now believe uh, and the president believes it, um, and, and many before him believed it. We now believe that using a weak dollar and strong dollar as a tool back and forth is an effective way to minister policy as opposed to having a permanently, systemically sound dollar, strong dollar, sound money policy. Um, in fact, we get mad at other countries for doing it and when we want to be doing it, you know, moving our dollar around to game uh, economic strength and imports and exports and trade deficits and things like that. So the point I'm making is that the Fed has a very serious task. And I'm critical of the fact that it's as serious as it is now because I think that's self-induced. I think they had an opportunity to not get us to this position. But that's not helpful right now. They, it, what's done is done. My point is this. We now need to um, have the Fed focused on sound dollar and have the Fed focused on balancing that uh, equilibrium, whatever that may be, around inflation and having necessary liquidity in the economy, dollar liquidity in the economy, to stem off deflationary threats without becoming inflationary. That's a pretty monumental task. It isn't like, let's do that and then maybe we can you know, pursue some side projects. That is what their task needs to be. And the fact of the matter is that having to be in a position to uh, administer monetary policy in a way that also enables the federal government to have liquidity for their spending projects, run the deficits they need to run, and, and exist with this massive national debt with the dollar as the world's reserve currency. That's not the Fed's objective, and that to me is the focus that we ought to, be, that we ought to have in terms of criticism and concern. So that's, that's the perspective I wanted to bring to you this week in the video. Uh, normally in the video I kind of give a full aftermath but both for our advice and insights listeners and just because I think this topic is important enough for you who watch the Dividend Cafe video 
Um, this is what I wanted to focus on. Read the article at Market Epicurean for a little more, and then by all means, read Dividend Cafe, listen to the Dividend Cafe podcast to get a kind of bigger overview of what's gone on in the market this week. Thank you for listening to the Advice and Insights podcast and watching the Dividend Cafe video.